Hello and welcome. Well, isolation is something that we've all had to deal with in some form or another right throughout this pandemic, but the effects of isolation can be much stronger, a much more intense experience for children, mainly because they have limited life experience to compare it to. And it's a a very um, normal human response, um, I guess, uh, how we sort of react uh, to to isolation, um, and I guess those reactions do serve a purpose. So our goal shouldn't be to totally dismiss how we feel about it. Our goal um, is and should be, however, I believe, you know how we can learn from it and work through these emotions. So lucky today, uh, we are joined by our special guest, Elizabeth Shaw, CEO of Relationships Australia, New South Wales, to talk uh, to us about the effects of isolation on children. Thank you for joining us today, Elizabeth. How are you? Hi, good. Thank you, Rachel. It's really great to be chatting to you on this topic. And it's something that no doubt, um, as we're living through something that we've got no, as adults, really no life experience to compare to also. It's, it's, a, it's a very unique scenario we're finding ourselves in. Um, one thing we do know, of course, that children sort of, um, as they grow, go through periods of insecurity and shyness. And of course, this is at normal and different ages and stages. Um, however, the effects of isolation on children are quite varied, as we know. Um, and I guess the issues and problems in their lives, as we know, also are magnified and disproportionate to what we know as adults. Um, their little worlds are much smaller. Um, so I just and initially, I'd love to know your thoughts um, on this in particular and how children how have and and are i guess reacting to to this this period of isolation we've been through and continuing to go through mm. well look i think um i think it's a very different experience for children and uh it's because as you said they don't have so much life experience to draw on so most of us find these the most of unusual times but to children it could be in effect um, a big part of their life that um, they might be spending six or seven months in in relatively um, isolated circumstances. And to a five-year-old, that's a really big deal. That's a big part of their living memory. So I think it can feel quite catastrophic. Their sense of time is very different. As we know, if you say to a child, uh, you'll be banned from television for 24 hours. To them, that's that's eternity. You know, they they. Um, so I think a day is very long, a week is very long, um, and so I think when you say we have to do this for a period of time, they really have no sense of what an ending to that looks like and how they're meant to resource themselves to get through it. So they look around them and they they try and read how they're supposed to feel from parents and. If you've got parents who are scared by what's happening or grandparents that are scared, then then they're going to read, should they be reassured or should they be frightened from from those who are modelling their reactions? Yes. Now, there's lots to talk about and from all different perspectives on this particular topic. But to begin with, um, we published your article titled The Effects of Isolation on Children. So for someone who hasn't read the article yet, could you please just give us an overview of what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it? Well, what we wanted to look at is the special effects on children. I think um, although as a community, as a series of communities, we're going through this together. And so there's something that we all have to comply with and put up with and manage different populations do experience this very differently. Um, Aboriginal communities are experiencing it differently. Elderly people uh, have special challenges and so is the case for children. So we wanted to draw attention to that because there's quite a lot of research around that at all sorts of different life stages, we actually forget to tune into children's experiences. And we tend to think that they can follow along or get over things or time will pass. And, um, and I think increasingly we understand that's not always the case, that, that dramatic life events can leave lasting impressions. And so what I wanted to look at is what, what are the effects and what should we be normalising and reassuring and what things perhaps could we be alert to that could indicate particular suffering and indicators for adults to move in and perhaps offer a little bit extra support. Mm. 
on that, I'd love to be able to understand from your perspective, what are the short and the long-term effects that you see on children, um, starting, I guess, maybe about the, the short-term effects of isolation? Yeah. What do you see them being? Yeah, well, there's, there's a variety of circumstances that could lead me to say something like, it depends. So I'll start with some, some broad um, statements about childhood. Um, so what we know is that we are inherently relational beings. So all of us need others to survive. Um, so, um, so there's very few people in life who really can exist as hermits. Every, every really needs to find ways to connect in and relate to others. So with children, what's important to them about the people in their lives is, particularly when they're little, um, they develop their sense of self from the reactions of others because children don't really know who they are and how they come across. And so their, their definition, their personality, the rules for living are all defined by people outside of them. So every time they do anything like draw a picture and you say, oh, that's a good drawing, they think I could be a good drawer, you know, so that they're developing their identity and their self-concept and their personality and their sense of success and resilience according to the feedback they get. So you take them out of um, a social situation such as school or if they might be at home, um, then immediately their world closes over. And as I mentioned before, their sense of time is, um, is very different. Um, and their sense of how to be resourceful is very different. If you say go off and play, there's very few children who know exactly how to do that for any decent length of time. So I think they really, they need us to work out how to do this. And they need to, um, they need us to find out kind of who they are and how they exist in the world. If you add elements such as maybe it's an only child or so they don't have siblings to go off and play with, or maybe they're staying with um, grandma at the moment because their parents have to work and they can't manage homeschooling. It may well be that their very circumstances um, lead them to be even more isolated, sort of isolated within isolated. Um, it also could be that say they just started school, so they'd just gone to kindy, they were there only a few weeks and then they were off again. Their whole sense of starting um, in their new lives or even having a sense of friends to turn to has got interrupted. So they don't have anyone to ring up or do Zoom calls and we're hearing a lot about that. We'll connect them in with their friends, but maybe the very spot where this landed in their lives they just weren't established enough with the cohort that's going to keep them going. So I think within that overall experience of childhood, there's particular variations that could make the struggle that little bit greater. Mm. How do you see um, what the possible long-term effects of isolation are then? Well, I think, um, I think the isolation, um, if, it, if it lasts a long time or there's other things that have crowded into this experience, um, the long-term effects can be can be certainly um, heightened. So, say for example, um, there's there's two things that a lot of research is indicating at the moment. One is that um, child protection issues and domestic violence issues can spike at this time, and also that couples who were already struggling can get into more trouble in their relationship. So, if you look at the family being locked in the home. Um, it's one thing if it's a happy family locked in a home. It's another thing if it's an unhappy family. And so this could be the time that, yes, we're all in it together and we're sort of shut in or we have been shut in. But if this is the time your parents' relationship falls apart or you're witnessing a great deal of conflict or even very frightening things, then that's where the long-term effects will kick in because um, some short-term effects, such as falling behind in your education and so on, you can catch those up. But the magnification of things, or say if your grandparents die during this time and you weren't able to say goodbye or go to the funeral, those are the kind of things that we will that will heighten this experience and in fact even introduce maybe a trauma kind of um, lens to <clears throat> how things are going for families. Very much so. 
very much so. And as you mentioned before, children develop um, their sense of worth and esteem through feedback and connection with others. So I'd love to know from your perspective, do you think that a, a period of isolation, be it any time that children are unable to be around others in, an, in a normal fashion, you know, COVID um, being one example, and of course there's going to be others um, throughout life, including a time of illness or being in hospital or moving house or changing schools, as examples, the following that these times that parents um, need to be, I guess, more mindful that children need more support than ever and possibly a lot of reassurance as they, uh, as the children are rebuilding their social skills. What are your thoughts on that? Look, absolutely, that's, that's true. And, and yet, you know, I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, for those of us that are parents, we know that these are challenging events for us too and that um, we, we want to be our best selves and we want to be there for our children. But sometimes, for example, you know, moving house or trying to work during homeschooling, sometimes we're just not at our best. And so the guilt factor is really high. And sometimes feeling terrible about what they're able to do or not do um, can sometimes overcompensate by sometimes, you know, giving more treats or giving the iPad more often just because they're desperate and trying to get through. So kind of wacky things that can happen that a parent will say, look, I never wanted to do that. I, I, it's not the sort of parent I want to be. Um, but I've had parents say to me, look, I simply couldn't maintain my job and do homeschooling. I had to give it up. You know, I had to let my children watch television and I feel terrible. So I think we've got to be realistic about this. So um, there's some simple things to do uh, which help parents and kids and part of that is um, stopping at certain points in the day and really looking at whether you've established that next phase is set up for success so it might be gee I've got to get my own work done but I've got to look after my child so sitting down and really making a plan together not only makes the child feel like for a moment they've got you which they love um, but also you can empower them and you can um, maybe give them some acknowledgement in that moment and then come back and acknowledge what they were able to do during that time. So you're building in strengths-based training, positive reinforcements and, and resilient building. Mm -hmm. um, I think too that, um, that so, so doing those kind of things together, but also stopping and asking kids how they're going. Do they have any questions? Because kids might feel like, well, I'm actually going on but I better not ask because mum or dad looks stressed enough but I think drawing that out um, you might be afraid of what you're going to hear but in the end you're better off knowing and being able to answer it because everybody relaxes and calms down a bit if you spend that bit of time eliciting the questions and concerns and explaining what's happening um, and I think too sometimes parents are so busy being conscientious and juggling as fast as they can <coughs> Sometimes they haven't thought to ask their work whether there, there can be a more family-friendly arrangement. You know, I just saw parents just spinning faster. Um, yeah. You know, that's very hard. But, you know, kids will do one of two things generally. They'll either become very compliant and um, fly under the radar and get very silent and withdrawn, or down the other end of the spectrum, they'll let you know that they're missing out by acting out, banging on the study door, you know, doing things that parents often call attention seeking, but attention seeking happens because kids need attention. Yes. Um, so, and, and they can do varied things in between, but if either one of those things are happening, it generally is a sign that you just need to calibrate the interaction a little bit better yes. so that you can set it up so both of you are free to get on with what you need to get on with. Yeah. And do you find that, I guess, reminding children of their own personal qualities um, and their past successes can help children um, in integrating back uh, into their lives after a period of isolation? Um, and uh, for example, now with the school holidays in a lot of states and all that sort of stuff as well, this now, because so many places are closed, is now, I guess, going to be considered as a period of isolation. So, I mean, do you have any other tips that could help? Um, mm. Yeah, I'd love to know what you're your thoughts on yeah. that look I think it is really important again for parents and kids to try and set up um, social uh, occasions for a shy child maybe one-on-one -on -one, um, just to keep some loose connections because kids often fear in going back to school will anyone remember who I am yes. as my best 
handed off with somebody else? Has everyone forgotten me? Um, I, I no longer can even remember the games we used to play together. Um, so I think helping kids start to remember what they were good at, remember their personal qualities, um, <coughs> you know, do some reinforcement about those sorts of things, but also breaking those skills down into doable tasks. So that's where maybe a one-on-one -on -one play date and then saying you could seek out that one person back at school is really important. And also validating the skills that will make your child thrive at school. So when your child speaks up in an engaged way or looks you in the face, you know, adults love that. Um, so just to really say, I've really enjoyed this conversation or gee, that was funny what you just said or whatever it is to, to help the child feel, you know, valuable and that they have skills that people enjoy and that their company's enjoyable. Um, I think what we have to do though is do it in an authentic way. Children know when you're just trying to say things that parents say. So if you try and say, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, off you go, when they're actually not feeling fine at all, um, that isn't helpful. That's inauthentic. And kids, what you're really doing is just pushing them away. Mm -hmm. um, and a stressed parent can do that with a, you know, a desire to be cheerful. But I think it's much more important to say, look, I know you're a bit scared and I know this is really tough. And we have to find a way to get this done. And I have every confidence in you. I believe in you. And, and these are the things that tell me you can do it. But I know you're scared. It's a better package to say some things like that um, uh, than it is to just um, say, off you go, you'll be fine. Um, I bet you'll love it when you get there because that may not be the child's experience at all. Yes. Great advice. Um, and I guess another thing is boredom and loneliness. Um, are, I guess, much harder for children to live through, yeah. as we said before, because they do have limited life experience to fall back on. Yeah. Um, so from your perspective, I'd love to know um, what are the effects of children um, feeling and li living through these emotions of boredom and loneliness? Look, I think, I think uh, you know, a long day for a child is a really long day. And, mm. um, and, and I think they can actually get quite depressed and anxious. And, and they can show that through, um, you know, a lot of the time uh, children will internalise um, of the two. These are broad brush strokes, but, but girls can tend to internalise and boys can tend to externalise their distress. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, you know, uh, it's not always the case, but that's sometimes what you see. So that's where you get the stereotype of sort of the naughty boy and the sort of compliant girl is is often the different ways they're acting out their depression and anxiety. So mm. we do need to say that they need the reassurance of being involved with people um, and, and helping them do things that feel more meaningful. I think if you just say, you know, go over there and play with your Lego, that can also feel interminable. Like how long do I do it? What's the point of that? You know, whereas I think if you say, can you draw these three pictures and we'll be giving one to Nana, one to our neighbour, and I want one on my desk. That's a purposeful activity. A child can feel a sense of achievement. They can see it hanging somewhere. Then they think, well, there's a point to that. So um, I think if you can think up short activities where uh, you can do together, like you can make a batch of cupcakes in about 10 minutes, but to a child, again, that's a sense of achievement. Then you'll eat them later, give them compliments. Um, so I think if you can think of some purposeful things, again, that can break down the sense of um, pointlessness, you know, the pointlessness in the day that can creep in. Um, but I think it's also creating relational bridges. Try and think of who you can rope into the situation. It might be another mum at school and you say, can you take the kids for one hour on Zoom and I'll take them for an hour on Zoom. Um, get Nana to read a book over Zoom, um, do homework together. Um, I think parents can get very isolated and then get into it's all up to me. They lose their creativity because they feel so overwhelmed. Um, but I think if you try and set up some of those routines um, or even if every two hours you walk around the block together and even if you race it and rush back, the child knows they've got you for a period of time and you did something with a point to it. You got fitter. It's per yes. Yeah. It's creating that, that sense of purpose and achievement. Yeah. And yeah. What about only children? Um, and one would think that they would be better suited to life uh, in isolation. Um, I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this. And is there anything that we can learn from them that can be helpful to other children? 
or not? <laughs> Well, look, I think, I think the people who are doing better in social isolation are people whose personalities are closer to introversion. So I've certainly had some, some people say to me, actually, I finally got permission to live the life that I, I prefer. <laughs> and, uh, and because, you know, and that's the same with children. I don't think uh, only children are necessarily um, able to carry this off any better. But it's certainly true that from a young age, often parents have encouraged an only child to be a bit more resourceful. But equally, there are only children who get all their parents' attention and, in fact, are not at all resourceful because they're the sort of um, the golden child between all the adults in the family and they're never left alone. Mm -hmm. So, again, it really depends on how your family was set up and, um, and how you've gone into this. And... Um, and so I think it's about knowing your child, knowing how they're going to thrive. And it's true enough that with an only child, you, you are going to have to find ways that they can pair and partner with a variety of people. Um, and, uh, and certainly if you have set things up, I should say generally with children, um, you know, you only have to do something twice in a row and to a child it's a routine. So um, during this time where they might have had more TV or more iPads or more Zoom time with Nana or whatever it is, um, helping them stay in a routine is part of keeping their world safe. So I think um, you might need to do exceptional things like for only children or, um, you know, because of loneliness and isolation. But if you can keep the scaffolding of your life um, in order, so bedtime's generally the same, meals generally the same, you've always got to clean your teeth. All of those rules for life also make children feel safer and more contained and more like, okay, there's some scary things happening, but my life's still on track because my little world happens the way it always happens and no one's lost the plot entirely. I'm not staying up half the night or wearing my pyjamas all day or, um, you know, I think it's about um, remembering that, that that helps a child feel on track. Um, and so, you know, don't give up on those routines. Yeah. And I guess when isolated children have to rely on their own resources, only children or, you know, children that have siblings, but um, this time um, can provide, I guess, an opportunity for children to develop their imagination and their creativity. Um, however, you know, for some children um, that struggle with, that, with creativity, um, this time can possibly also foster emotions of frustration and irritability. Mm. So I'd like to know yeah. from your perspective, do you think that parents should play a big part of helping children work through these challenges? Or is it a good opportunity to have children develop, um, I guess, all these all important life skills of developing and fostering imagination and creativity. What are your thoughts? Um, look, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's almost like chasing a rainbow. I think as adults, we, we have this sort of nostalgic and visionary idea that, um, you know, children have endless imaginative possibilities. And some, some children, you know, do have lovely, lively imaginations, but... Um, imagination is again built and fostered through the sort of um, the digestible sort of resources at hand so the more that they're exposed to stories and people and um, they're in conversation and they're seeing movies and they're out in the world that's they need fuel for their imagination just like the best writers the best adult writers you know need to need to fuel it very few people can just um, sit at their desk in a closed room and have a great imagination. So I think we often forget our imagination is also socialised. So I think uh, children develop that often by having an adult sit with them and play a game and, and let the child springboard that game into another game or follow a train of thought themselves and for you to witness and be an audience to that and celebrate it. Then the child comes to value their imagination and um, even get acknowledged for that. So there will be some children who, who do that, who've had it fostered and naturally go there, but other kids need you to start them off. Um, and so I think, again, we shouldn't push them away as if leaving them alone, they will just be more imaginative. I think that, again, is just another pushing them away. Um, instead, we have to say, here's, here's a game. It could look like this. Um, or there's a box of Lego I wonder how many cars you could find in there. 
and you could help them start the picture off and then, then they can take it from there. But I think just to say, go into the garden and find your own fun, generally, it, it really never worked for any of us. Um, and if you've got a tribe of siblings, you certainly probably could do something based on history, but there might be kids who really flounder and then they'll just get distressed and come back inside and bug you for ideas. So better to set it off from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Great advice. And um, from your perspective, like what are your thoughts on looking at this time of isolation positively as a, a time to teach children the life skills of resilience and perseverance? What are your thoughts on that? Look, absolutely. I think, you know, um, all of these are learning opportunities and that's what will make it the difference between a traumatic time and a time where everybody can look back on and reflect. Um, so certainly uh, I do talk to families who are inventing a whole lot of old fashioned games and allowing their children, you know, they're doing things like everyone's taking a turn to think of a game um, and each person's in charge of a day and what they're gonna do. And um, there's some lovely things happening that I'm sure families will look back on and say, you know, remember that time we did a jigsaw a day and it'll be a set of really great memories. Um, and there will be people who, um, who, who struggle terribly. And, uh, you know, I think it's also dependent on whether the parents are travelling well, um, because if parents are feeling obviously frustrated and irritable, but also upbeat and, and they're having their own social needs met and they're being resourced from outside, then they also bring life to their children. If they yeah. see a parent not travelling well, they will feel this is more catastrophic because mm -hmm. they don't have to look after their parents. So, so I think there's a whole combination. There's a sort of a swirling set of factors that yeah. will make this time people look back on with some lovely family memories and those who might find that it was um, really very painful. So on that topic, um, how much of parents' state of mind do you think affects their children? Um, and should parents be aware of this even more so uh, during the times of isolation and then following? Yeah. Look, I think children, particularly young children, will always look to their parents to give them a reading of how this is. So a parent who is in, you know, really struggling um, will indicate to a child that there is a lot of struggle. Now, that isn't said to make parents feel bad because we're human and we can't help it and there's times in our lives that are just not perfect. So it's more about how do you communicate that to your child and sometimes making it an open conversation, like it might be in the morning doing a barometer check, you know, how are we all feeling about the day? Well, I, I feel really flat today. I'm just thinking, oh, what, what am I going to do to fill in the day? And what are you thinking? And someone could say, well, I've got an idea for a game. And you make all answers valid, all answers valid. So it might be, oh, no ideas today. Who's got an idea? Um, and so you're still expressing what's going on for you. Um, and I think saying to your family, um, look, we're all going to go through a range of things. We might be cranky, we might be sad, we might be happy, and you might even brainstorm, what are all the things we could feel? And um, let's take a turn each day in feeling those feelings. You make it permissible. So you can say, well, I'm being grumpy today. And, um, and then, you know, it, your child has a point of reference um, and, uh, and also knows that it could be time limited. You can have a grumpy morning and a happy afternoon or a sad night and a fresh start, you know. So I think, I think making these conversations, um, and I also think making a plan together at, at what, do we, what do we hope to do better today? What did we do really well yesterday that we could repeat today? Um, what did we do badly yesterday that let's <laughs> never do that again? Make it a conversation like that. And even once a week over a dinner, say, um, what, was the, what was the thing we most learnt this week? All of those things build resilience, but the other great thing is they make all feelings permissible and they make them time limited. So yes. to say it's okay that mum cried this morning because, um, you know, because then mum can say, yeah, I had a really bad start to that. I'm feeling so much better now I had a good cry. If, if an adult can model that, then it's not catastrophic to go through a bad patch. It's normal. Mm -hmm. And then looking um, at the children again now, what are the signs, I guess, that we should look, uh, look for if a child has been affected by isolation? Yeah, look, I think if you are seeing your child um, 
uh, seem to go backwards in terms of developmental milestones. So a child that was able to tie their own shoelaces suddenly seems to not be able to or says they've forgotten. Um, then that, that can be, um, you know, when they're sort of retreating into babyhood again, sometimes I don't, children are not plotting anything. So I don't in any way mean to make this sound conscious, mm. but sometimes you look at the effect of it. The effect of it is to get the parent re-engaged. So suddenly, you know, mum or dad's hovering and doing the shoes and having a bit of a cuddle and getting you dressed again. That's a way of, you know, bringing some security and love and sort of holding on to the moment a bit longer. So a little bit of babying or regression is, um, it just invites a bit more support. Mm -hmm. um, it's long standing, not a few days or a day to day thing, but it's actually, you really see your child that kind of way or, or looking sadder. Um, or being sleepier or, um, uh, you know, struggling to sort of enjoy the things they normally would enjoy or getting shyer, then that, that could be a sign that, that they're, you know, getting a little bit more depressed and, um, and spending a bit more time or even opening up some new possibilities could be important. Mm -hmm. um, children may be getting anxious, but you might be able to help them with that by thinking, well, I wonder if I've accidentally conveyed that or... Have they been around someone? And that could be a time to just sit and say, look, have you got any questions? Because it's pretty scary. I just watched the news and wasn't that weird what that person said? And just make it a conversation. Then a child can often really relax. Um, equally, if your child at the other end of the spectrum is acting out a lot more, being demanding, maybe um, being naughtier, again, just try and say, this is a way to engage. It's a way to engage others. And it may be that they're floundering um, and that's their best way to get you back, back sort of paying attention. Um, and so often you need to give more attention to an attention seeker. Adults tend to want to turn away from that. They go, yuck, I don't like that behaviour. I don't want to reinforce <laughs> it. But I think if you get in before it starts um, to say, I'm going to give you 30 minutes of the most attention, you're not going to believe how much attention I'm going to give you, and you, you do something... Um, then I think it, it often, you, you front load it, you're more likely to have a bit of downtime after that. Yeah, great advice. And also, do you think that maybe um, like a period of isolation is an opportunity for parents to teach children self-regulation? Um, that being um, to help children understand how their emotions run through their little bodies and how they react to certain situations or with the view to help them better understand themselves? What are your thoughts? Look, absolutely. I think all of these times are an occasion to do that. Um, and in some ways, there is more time to do that. I think parents are saying, even if they're working and the boundaries around work are getting more fluid, they are around a bit more. And, um, and you are hanging out together for breakfast, lunch and dinner where you wouldn't <laughs> normally. So there are opportunities to talk about, oh, look, how was your morning? Mine was pretty boring. I was a bit annoyed today. Um, or I had this really um, boring meeting. Or again, I think checking in, what it does is it enables everyone to um, develop emotional intelligence, put names to feelings, um, discuss how normal they are, okay, let's develop a plan for boredom. What's a great boredom plan? Um, what it does is it teaches children that these are things you can get on top of. You can have bad feelings, but you can rise above them. You can manage them. You can tolerate them. You can ride them out. Um, so I think, I think naming how to do that as a skill, but also reflecting on when you didn't survive it. So a parent might say, oh, I really lost it this morning. I think I was far too grumpy. You were only doing this small thing and I lost the plot and sorry about that. That's also great modelling. Um, so definitely this is an opportunity like any other to do that. Mm -hmm. I think we've also got to bear in mind that if we are able to do a bit more with our children, when normal life starts up again, that can involve a loss you know, um, because you've had this some good times and that can involve a loss. So maybe try and think about what have we done well as a family? What's been really successful and what could we hold on to? What are the things we'd really miss? You know, and maybe it is family dinners or maybe it is those Sunday afternoon bike rides. Try and think about what's something you could take forward. So this Positive. doesn't remain some aberrant time, yeah. you know, that time where we all did odd things. Mm -hmm. um, Instead, there's some things you could learn from and, and take forward into the future. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that children will unconsciously find ways to have their needs 
for connection met mm. or depending who is around to hear it. And if no one hears, yeah. then they will further modify their behavior um, either by giving up or escalating their, their behavior, um, as you mentioned. Mm. So do you think this is a time for parents to be more vigilant and aware of their children's emotions and um, even more so, even more empathetic towards their children? Well, I think it's a good time for the family generally to talk about those skills, to say um, we're all going through a tough time and we all need to cut each other a bit more slack mm. and pay attention because any one of us could have a rough day and what can the others do to help? Um, we might all take a turn having a rough day. Um, and so I think the more you can talk it up in a preemptive way, it gives permission for it, it normalises it, it doesn't... It's not... Um, one child's just being really annoying and difficult. It's just like, yeah, they're having a bad day. We're all going to have bad days. I think some of that is very normal and it doesn't pathologise anybody. Mm. Um, there's more forgiveness in it and there's more an opportunity for each day to be different rather than well, you're stuck being the naughty person and you've just ruined isolation for everybody. <laughs> um, I think doing those sorts of things is... Um, is, uh, is, is really important. And then when things go wrong, um, yes, to try and say, um, well, this could be because of COVID. It may not be because my child's not compliant or my child's naughty or my child's um, not imaginative enough. It, it might actually be because, yeah, this is tough and kids need people and there aren't as many people to bring to this equation. I mean, single parents who've just moved their families to Sydney or wherever you are, or, you know, all the grandparents in the family have died or, you know, sometimes there's extra factors that really mean the family is very isolated. Yes. Um, so they're probably and, doing pretty well most of the time. And, and talking about empathy, what about parents who may struggle with empathy and being empathetic? Let's say that they were never really taught it as a child and they mm. actually find it hard to connect with how others feel. Do you have any other tips and advice for parents that do want and wish to be empathetic towards mm. their children and their emotions, but just mm. struggle with that connection? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I think just like that old analogy that you've often got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you share with a child, I think, um, you know, that uh, often we need to, as adults, be kind to ourselves first. If no one's being kind to us, it might be, it might be saying, you know, yeah, I feel guilty and bad and I'm not a good parent, I'm not a good worker and all those things. And, and then say, well, look, maybe I'm giving myself a hard time and maybe I need to cut myself a bit of slack first and look at what I'm doing well and look at how I could forgive myself for my, you know, the things I'm doing and, and you know, where I've done okay and where I can do better and then turn my attention to the child. Sometimes that's helpful. If you're giving yourself a good kicking, you're much more likely to give those around you a bit of a kicking too. You know, um, hopefully not literally, of course, but <laughs> but in to say, well, if only my child was better behaved, I wouldn't be so stressed. Um, is is to try and say, well, maybe we're all just trying to make do. You know, yes. and maybe not that well behaved, and maybe we should just sit and have a cuddle and be kind to each other. Um, I, I think there's something about addressing your own needs for a bit of softness as well, which gives you a starting place to feel softer towards others. Um, but some parents who, who do find it a struggle, even if they can dutifully do things like inquire after feelings, um, inquire after, do you have anything to do? Do you need some ideas? Even just doing some things by rote learning um, you'll have a better outcome, even if you can't really make sense of all the feelings that are being stirred up. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, children do learn and modify their behaviour depending on who is there to receive it and comment on mm -hmm. it. Uh, do you yeah. think that parents are just trying to do the best with what resources they have at their disposal? I mean, everyone's just wanting the best for their children anyway. In the first, first... Well, look, it's certainly true most people are. I mean, there are, of course a lot of parents who are struggling during this time who are feeling pretty rotten about themselves, their situation and how stressful it's been. Mm. I don't think any parent signed up to be a home teacher as well. <laughs> um, and, and also, you know, if you're in a family where um, both parents or 
the parent lost their jobs, um, you, you could have real fears for the future and it might have been a very deprived time. So, so that's where I think we've got to be, um, you know, very kind and cautious about what we've expected of ourselves and each other. Um, because there are some real hardships and there are people who are very frightened about the future for themselves and their family um, yes. and how they're going to maybe make up financially for this hard time. And there are a lot of people who've needed to rely on charity that have never done that before. Yeah, no. So I, I, there are some really um, tough times. And yes, the majority of parents are really trying to do the best by their kids and by themselves. And um and need to be more forgiving. I think when you're more forgiving and you are less critical, then you are naturally kinder. And you then display that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to have rough moments, we can still love each other. You lower the emotional tone in the family. And um, whereas if it's very brittle and on, on edge and at the end of anger um, all the time, children will pick up on those vibes and uh, it will worry them more. Yes. And in, in your view, at what point is it worth having a consultation uh, with the family therapist? Is this mainly when problems seem to linger uh, and be part of a longer pattern or I guess, or a family situation that has impacted, I guess, the confidence and the social development of children? Like at what point do, would parents yeah. know is the right time? Yeah, look, I think, um, I think you, you know, you've certainly named a number of the elements because some people going into COVID already were identifying some concerns and those are just exacerbated. And so definitely um, to know that organisations like Relationships Australia are, have been open for business and can assist. Mm -hmm. I think when you're worried as a parent, it's often about the parent getting some reassurance and some tips um, and just being validated and maybe kindness and that support and noticing the strengths and successes um, can be really, really helpful. So, um, so certainly when the problems are lingering, when they seem to have escalated, when you want to almost have a start gun go off, okay, we're going to do some new things, <laughs> an appointment and a family meeting with someone facilitating it and cooking up some new ideas and making a new plan. Sometimes, you know, a family can leave saying, okay, we've drawn a line in the sand. We're now going to do something different. Sometimes um, really distinguishing a before and after, you can do a lot of that quite playfully in a, in a session and generally with families that are traveling okay most of the time, one or two conversations with our clever facilitator, the family can often be off and running, you know, in a new direction. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't take much. Time or a, it doesn't have to for families that are well resourced, but for those who've really had a cascade of trouble in this time and violence could have escalated, jobs could have been lost, um, you know, families could have separated, um, then I think building in some scaffolding to try and dig your way out of it and, and come up with a plan ahead is also really necessary. Mm. Um, don't make yourself more isolated than you have to be um, because even ringing and talking to someone could be a very useful thing to do. Yes. And do you think that this approach is much more of a, like we're all in this together approach than focusing on the child being the problem, do you think? Absolutely. Because often the way I see it is that, um, is that you you have a you have a member of the family that sometimes seems to hold all the symptoms, you know. So it might be the child who's going nuts all the time, or the child who's very sad and crying all the time. But when I start to talk to the family, I often find that that child is almost symbolically representing a whole lot of things going on. Yes, um, and they pick it up like Velcro, and they <laughs> and they often bring the family in. We're all worried about little Freddie. But as I talk, I find everybody's worried, you know, and they're just worried about a whole stack of things. And um, and opening up that conversation depathologizes not only the child but the situation, and um, and can give everybody a fresh look at what's going on. And um, that's very mobilising. And do you think that it's important to make um, getting help uh, a great resource that children can learn to welcome and utilise rather than an experience um, that, they, that they have as being in trouble or um, inadequate or them being inadequate or they've been a problem that's actually uh, yeah. uh, turned into a positive? <clears throat> Look, absolutely. It's really important to set the session up well to say, we're going to speak to someone who knows all about families and we are going to have a good conversation where we can get some new ideas. <clears throat> then that 
very much like going to school or going to the doctor or whatever. Um, I've had, I've had uh, family sessions where the parents have said, you're in trouble and I'm taking you to see this woman who's going to tell you um, how much trouble you are and that's incredibly unhelpful because then the children arrive panicked um, as if they're dragged to the principal's office. That's, what you really want is to say getting help is a great thing. Getting help is a normal thing. Opening yourself up to new possibilities will stand you in, stead, in good stead for the rest of your life. Yes. So um, even if you're really very irritated and um, upset, try and make the session itself a positive thing to do. Yes. Well, look, we've covered a lot in this chat today. How would you summarise your key messages to anyone watching or listening? Look, I think there is something about um, acknowledging that we've been through a tough time and we need to be kind to each other, mm. that there is something about um, this very unusual period where a lot of people have built new skills, resilience and connections that it's really worth holding on to um, rather than trying to write it off as a disaster. There are some people who've done it tough who are emerging from this with some big questions about their life and I would encourage people to to get some support for themselves and their families before just continuing the doing it tough kind of frame. And also bear in mind that little people do need special attention. They will follow the adults' leads, but they're not, they're not just malleable um, little people who will just fit in and survive and forget the whole thing and just move on. They often do need some focused attention um, to package this phase up as um, a constructive part of their past before they can move on to the next developmental steps. And if they have seemed to lose confidence or lose some skills um, or, you know, develop some behaviours that you're not so pleased with, so just bear in mind that a very solid, tight routine and some gentle um, re-entry back into uh, good practices and good relationships um, will generally iron most things out. Wonderful. And if families would like to take that step forward um, positively to, to, to learn more and find more information from Relationships Australia, whereabouts can they find you? Well, they certainly can uh, look on our website at uh, Relationships Australia. There's one of us in every state and territory, so you'll find us under New South Wales. But we, we offer a whole range of services with lots of different resources. And also in terms of um, in terms of ringing for an appointment, it's a one three hundred number one three hundred three six four two double seven. Wonderful, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been a wonderful conversation, and really hope for the thank opportunity you. to have a, another chat again in the future. Take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rachel. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.